In this episode, I want to talk about something that's hard to put a really nice title onto. Can you keep the original scale of the measurement and meet the assumptions too? That's the best I could do. In order to discuss it, let's look at an example study. And it had to do with how various different independent variables predicted reaction time to words. So for example, there are different types of words and there are words of different frequencies and both of those independent variables were significant predictors of reaction time. Now the relationship between reaction time and word frequency was such that for every one unit increase in frequency, reaction time decreases by 45.42 milliseconds. That's pretty easy to comprehend. Now, here's something that linguists and a lot of researchers who use statistics don't do. They'll do an analysis, get the result, and they won't bother to check that the assumptions of the analysis have been met. Because if they haven't been met, then the results aren't valid. So, does this model meet the assumptions? And the assumptions here are that the residuals are normally distributed and that the residuals are heteroscedastic. Studies with reaction times are notorious for violating these assumptions. So let's look at the distribution of the residuals. Are they normally distributed? No. They're positively skewed and don't fit into a nice bell curve. Are the residuals heteroscedastic? No, they aren't evenly distributed. So the violated assumptions mean that the results aren't even valid. One way to deal with violations of assumptions, especially violations dealing with reaction times, is to transform the reaction time. I used a natural logarithm and I converted the reaction times into the natural log of reaction time and reran the stats. The same variables turned out significant and the residuals are now more normally distributed and are heteroscedastic. So now we've been sure that the assumptions have been met. Let's look at the relationship between frequency and reaction time. What we see now is that for every one unit increase in frequency, the natural log of the reaction time decreases by 0.04336. I mean, is that even interpretable? We understand reaction time in milliseconds, but reaction times in the natural log of milliseconds? That's hard to wrap our heads around. So we're in this conundrum. We need to meet the assumptions of the analysis, but we want to be able to interpret the results based on the original scale of the dependent variable, in this case, milliseconds. So we can't meet the assumptions without transforming the dependent variable, making the results hard to interpret. So how can we have our original scale of measurement and meet the assumptions too? Well, those assumptions must be met in a linear mixed model. Can you run the analysis in a generalized linear model instead? Because a generalized linear mixed model doesn't have those assumptions. Well, if you run a GLMM with the identity link, it's the same thing as running an LMM. The, the same assumptions must be met. But if you run a GLMM with a log link and a gamma distributions, the assumptions don't have to be met and you don't have to transform your variable. Here's how you uh, would run that analysis in Jamobi. So the results of a GLMM with a log link and a gamma distribution results in the same significant variables and a similar coefficient. So for every one unit increase in frequency, reaction time goes down by about 40 milliseconds. The coefficient is very similar. The nice thing is we don't need to meet the assumptions and the results are given in original untransformed milliseconds. I want to give special thanks to Marcello Gallucci who is the brains behind solving this enigma. <laughs>